History is ours. Burned and buried, we carried a quilt containing a myriad of stories. From the spoken word to written truths, our ancestors are born anew. Even in the midst of incredible hardship, people have the power to make a difference. We find the spirit of Malcolm and Martin Garvey and Black Panther in the starry-eyed youth. A group of high schoolers coming all the way from Philadelphia to help people, it's a really special feeling, like it's hard to describe. Black history is a celebration of our collective obligation. He never thought that what he was doing was out of the ordinary. You know, he just felt that this is something that needed to be done and he was going to be the person to do it. To bring lost knowledge to all nations, uncovering a northern light that makes even the darkest night clear. People start to, hopefully over time, just Except that everybody's a little different, but we're all the same. This is Discover Black Heritage. NBC 10 presents Discover Black Heritage, brought to you by TD Bank. I'm Johnny Archer. Welcome to Discover Black Heritage. Over the next 30 minutes, NBC10 will highlight local heroes who personify black excellence. Coming up, we'll introduce you to a graphic novelist who is changing the game and teaching kids to embrace their inner superheroes. Plus, young, gifted, and black. We'll bring you the incredible story of a group of high school engineers. They're changing the world and using technology to bring clean water to communities that need it. But in order to talk about the present, it's important to know our past. Philadelphia's black communities were shaped by the Great Migration. That's when around 6 million black people moved from the South to Northern and Western states to escape the oppression of Jim Crow. There is a long list of iconic black leaders with ties to our area, from Philadelphia's own Guy Bluford, who was the first African-American to go into space, to New Jersey's Paul Robeson, who mesmerized audiences nationwide. And then there's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Did you know his dream of equality can be traced back to a cafe in Maple Shade, Burlington County? NBC10's Claudia Vargas has the story. The grassy patch next to the Route 73 off-ramp in Maple Shade used to be Mary's Cafe. It was a neighborhood bar, uh, working class, uh, blue collar. And yet, this former bar has a special place in history. On June 12, 1950, Martin Luther King Jr. was visiting a friend from seminary school who was staying in Camden. We've got some difficult days ahead. According to accounts at the time, King and three other black people went to Mary's Cafe late on a Sunday evening. This was before King was known for his civil rights leadership. They came in and asked for uh, four glasses and some beer. The bar owner says uh, it's late on a Sunday night. I can't serve you any beer. Why they went to that bar and what happened after has been the recent subject of discussion among some local historians. We went to the Free Library to learn more. Newspaper articles and at least one biographer of Martin Luther King Jr. say the bar owner asked the group to leave. When they did not, the owner came back with a gun. And he shoots the gun outside the door and tells him, you know, get out, I've killed for less. King and his companions went to the police and filed a complaint. The police arrested the bar owner and charged him for violating the state's recently established anti-discrimination law and for brandishing a gun. In 1950, it was unheard of for somebody white to be arrested on behalf of somebody black. The incident made front page news in the Philadelphia Tribune, the city's black newspaper. The headline focused on one of the women involved, a Philadelphia police officer, King at the time was referenced as a college student. He was a seminarian at Crozier Theological Seminary in Chester. The bar owner was found guilty on the gun charge, but the discrimination charge was dismissed for lack of testimony from witnesses, including King. You got to remember, this was 1950 when Pennsylvania, the United States was steeped in Jim Crow segregation. It was the America's apartheid. Still, Lynn Washington, who is a Temple journalism professor and has studied the historical significance of the Maple Shade incident, says King planned to sit in at the bar. They came here uh, to test New Jersey's uh, anti-discrimination law. New Jersey had to uh, pass the first statewide anti-discrimination measure. Camden County East NAACP member Keith Benson 
also believes that Mary's Cafe was the start of King's civil rights movement. Martin Luther King was able to launch his first uh, official foray into civil rights and his success inspired him to become the greatest civil rights uh, advocate in the history of mankind. The King Center in Atlanta says it doesn't have enough information on the incident to confirm either way. In the Free Library's microfilm section, we found a 1961 Philadelphia Tribune article in which King speaks about the Maple Shade incident. When in 1951, driving two friends from Philadelphia to Merchantville, New Jersey, the group stopped for some food. Quote, they refused to serve us, Dr. King said. It was a painful experience because we decided to sit in. Benson says the fact that King called it a sit-in says it all. As soon as Martin had that opening to, to assert manhood and personhood and humanhood, he did, and he did at a high level. And I think he obviously must have liked the way it tasted, liked the way it felt, because he dedicated his life to it. A school in Philadelphia is producing tomorrow's engineers and scientists. It's a field where black people are historically underrepresented. But the charter school we're going to take you to is trying to change that while their students are trying to change the world. The Push to Inspire, brought to you by Parks Casino, a proud and dedicated community partner in the Delaware Valley. These STEM students are on a mission inside Imhotep Institute Charter School in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. That mission starts by trying to solve a problem. We have been innovating these water filters to work uh, more effectively and efficiently. They're designing water filters to help clean water. The team using this 3D printer to bring their design to life. One thing is trial and error, so we're going to make mistakes, we're going to have different mess ups and things like that, but that's a part of the process. Montrell Irvin Jr. is a senior. And this is going to be the one. One of the lead engineers of the project. I get to actually have hands-on experience with 3D printing again because it was something that I was really fond of. These projects the students are doing don't just stay here in the classroom. These are projects that are solving real-life problems, not just in Philadelphia, but in other countries too. In Ghana, we have to service a lot of people. A lot of people do need our help. In May, these students will be heading to the coastal town of Keta in the West African country of Ghana. According to a 2013 study published in the Open Journal of Modern Hydrology, Keta's water quality is poor and unsuitable for drinking due to climate change and pollution. Where exactly, when we're looking at thinking about the geography of Keto? This is Shirley Posey. She's the director of STEM at Imhotep. Instead of just teaching our students about printing, about coding, we're making them do a deep dive and look at what problems is our uh, planet Earth facing right now and how can we solve them. That's exactly what these students are doing. They'll be helping some 3,000 people who desperately need clean water in Keta. The students will be handing out filters they made and donating several 3D printers for Ghanaians to make filters themselves. These little holes will also help break down these pathogens that are in our water. And this is not their first time they've made filters for people in need. Last October, they gave out 100 filters to people in Jackson, Mississippi, who have suffered from undrinkable water for years. We'll be like, oh, we can do this, we can fix it. And we get straight to work, like, with Jackson, Mississippi. She came to me one day, she was like, do you wanna be, um, do you wanna help with the water? A group of high schoolers, with the oldest person being 18, and coming all the way from Philadelphia and traveling to different parts of the world to help people who have been needing help for decades and years and years and years on end, like it's, it's a really special feeling, like it's hard to describe. These students of color leading the way in a field with little representation. According to the Pew Research Center, only 9% of people working in STEM are black. But these students are also working to solve that problem too. So now we're giving these students 14, 15, 16 year olds in the city of Philadelphia, these opportunities were bringing about change and creating global leaders. And so that just makes my heart happy that we're creating innovators that are gonna change the world. Those are some really smart kids. And we can't talk about black culture without talking about art. And a local graphic novelist is using his gift to help children recognize the power within themselves. Jamar Nicholas is the author of Leon the Extraordinary. Growing up, Jamar could not find a character who looked like him, so he made one himself. 
NBC 10's Leah Uko has the story. With every stroke of the marker, we get a clearer picture of who Leon the Extraordinary is. A kid comic book character with locked hair, dark brown skin, dressed up in lime green attire, and a utility belt. He's the main character on the cover of a book which is still kind of shocking to people. Jamar Nicholas created this fictional character. It's a series. Yeah, so this uh, uh, image we're looking at is the cover of my first Leon book that I self-published. His 25-year career recently led him to a scholastic book publishing deal. The graphic novels show readers how an ordinary grade school student overcomes superheroes, and super villains by using his brain and heart to solve conflict. Life skills Jamar says many young kids in Philly didn't have when he was growing up. Growing up in the city makes kids grow up really fast. And with kids who want to draw maybe, or even just like <laughs> figure out how not to hit somebody when you get you know in a conflict, if there are people around you that are kind of helping you answer these problems or know that you're having these issues, um, you know, maybe you can get some, some advice from Leon. At age three, Jamar picked up tools and started drawing characters he says he always saw in real life, but never in comic books. Why can't there be, you know, a Muslim kid? Or why can't there be a blind kid? Or, you know, a kid who's an amputee? Uh, you know, I'm dark skinned, I have locks. People start to hopefully over time just accept that everybody's a little different, but we're all the same. We asked Jamar if he considers himself a groundbreaking part of yeah, black history, a, creating a main character like Leon in an industry that had not always embraced black cartoonists. I have made a career out of doing things that no one's done yet. So in that case, then maybe I am. Maybe? Maybe. Sure I am. But he says there's a thin line between expressing gratitude and bragging and knowing how to walk that line is his superpower. Uh, just staying on your purpose and moving forward, always evolving. You do something, you have your small celebration, and you just keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. Leah Uko, NBC 10 News. Our genesis is deeper than any shovel can dig. That became his mission to educate people that our history didn't start with slavery. Mr. Hakeem dug deeper than most to find a hidden water source below. Now our city's roots grow. Nobody wanted to read these books initially. Now we can't keep these books on the shelves. Next, the history and future emerges from between the lines, one page at a time. TD Bank is committed to celebrating black communities, customers, and colleagues every day in February and March forward. There's a tribute to heroes right in the heart of North Philadelphia. The worst thing in the world is for people to accomplish the things they've accomplished and let them go unnoticed. Leaders and Legends at Smith Memorial Playground allows kids to step into a world where any and everything is possible. You'll find these colorful enclosures which focus on the life and legacy of black and brown people making a difference in our community. You know, I'm really honored to be part of this. I think part of the work that I do is to try to inspire kids to figure out what they want to do for careers and uh, help them understand that there's so many different things that they can do for careers that are exciting. And so I'm really glad to see this here as a way to inspire kids. You can visit Leaders and Legends any day through the end of Black History Month. Jacqueline London, NBC 10 News. Black History in Philadelphia is an open book or an open book store in this next case. Hakeem's Bookstore is the city's oldest black-owned bookstore. 
It's a concept that started with a dream, but now it's being kept alive by what matters most, family. NBC 10's Aaron Baskerville shows us how they're making a difference one page at a time. History Between the Lines, brought to you by the African American Museum in Philadelphia. So that's my dad in the doorway. This used to be a black owned restaurant uh, called Broadway. History at her fingertips. Yvonne Blake can't help but get emotional as she looked at old photos of her dad. I like this picture of my dad here in the store with a customer. It was 64 years ago when Dawood Hakeem made his thirst for African American culture into a Philadelphia landmark. Hakeem started reading books about black history not taught in schools and then selling them out of his car. His daughter now runs his dream after he died in 1997. It took a while for it to catch on that there were books about African Americans that told our true history. So that became his mission to educate people that our, our, our history didn't start with slavery. The bookstore stood the test of time, moving from its original location on Walnut in West Philadelphia to eventually the 52nd Street Corridor. Jabari Jones with the West Philadelphia Corridor Collaborative can't imagine the neighborhood without it. It helps the neighborhood be stable. It helps that those returning customers who go to that store continually frequent this corridor. And I think we need to celebrate those businesses because at the end of the day, this is not the easiest city to do business in. The photos and news clippings detail the history, but the value is hard to describe. A new historical marker on the way in the next few months doesn't hurt, acknowledging Hakeem's as Philadelphia's first and oldest black-owned bookstore. Nobody wanted to read these books initially. Now we can't keep these books on the shelves. Uh, he would be happy. He would be happy, but he would, he would feel that he didn't do anything extraordinary. He never thought that what he was doing was out of the ordinary. You know, he just felt that this is something that needed to be done and he was going to be the person to do it. Blake tells NBC 10 she still sells books that her father sold years and years ago. You know, I pride myself for having more books than sneakers now, you know, because that wasn't always the case. The store has been through changes, adding Chris Arnold to the staff in 2017 to bring them into the 21st century. There's more of a focus on online sales and shipping books across the country, but Arnold says customers still embrace the history when they walk in. 60 years uh, is older than some of what the people are um, that's walking up and down the street, um, but I can tell that when they come in here, they feel the, the 60 plus years of impact um, and just lessons that's been mutually exchanged. I loved his restaurant, the restaurant of knowledge, and the menu was delightful. Whenever As Blake read a card sent to the family once her father died, she thought about the legacy he left behind and the one she's still working on. Aaron Baskerville, NBC 10 News. The Museum of American Revolution shares stories about people who sparked America's experiment in liberty and self-government. And a new exhibit highlights a prominent black family and their tireless pursuit of freedom and equality. It's called Black Founders, the Fortin Family of Philadelphia. NBC 10's Francis Wang takes us inside. Discovering Black History, brought to you by WHYY's Celebration of Extraordinary Black Americans all year long. We will prove ourselves men. Like, how powerful right. is that? In the new exhibition at the Museum of the American Revolution, there are powerful visuals like this flag telling stories that have largely been untold. Their hope is to prove their citizenship, right? Their hope is to prove their manhood. This story is centered around James Fortin, born in Philadelphia, just nine years old when he first heard the Declaration of Independence. Though while he was born free, he's descended from an enslaved person. As a teenager, he joined the American Revolution, becoming a prisoner of war to the British. He so deeply believed in the revolution that he turned down two opportunities to be freed. By the 1800s, Fortin found success here in Philadelphia. And then he uses that money and uses the voice that he is able to gain from that, the political stature, the social stature, to push to make sure that the ideals of the American Revolution apply to all Philadelphians, especially the African American community. And now through seven generations of descendants, Museum curators are able to bring Fortin's story to life. It's sort of like pulling a thread 
out of the quilt that is our core exhibition. Oftentimes, the stories of people of African descent are left out of that larger narrative. Just the fact that so many of these objects and documents exist to build this exhibit, Director of Education Adrian Whaley says is a wonder. Like, look at this thing. This is the Fortin Family Bible. Now, all of it can be seen by those who come to this museum, from Pennsylvania's governor, who asked for Fortin's portraits in his home, to the children of Philadelphia. Who might only live four or five blocks away from the museum, but don't necessarily feel that this historic area is really connected to them, that they're part of the story, and they are so much. Even in the midst of incredible hardship, people have the power to make a difference. In Philadelphia, I'm Francis Wang, NBC 10 News. They may not know why she smiles. Hey, guys. But gravity can't hold down her in a light. People always call me dimples anywhere I went. Her smile can carry millions, but she's got billions more where that came from. This dream that I had when I was 13 years old. Watch her share her light to brighten up the day. Talk about the Eagles without mentioning Brandon Graham. He's back up. He sacked back at the 36. But his impact stretches far beyond the football field. BG is known for not only encouraging others, but as an inspiration for those who need help the most. Everyone in this room has been impacted by your generosity, your inspirational nature, and the pure joy you exude in life. From working out with Matt Helm, who was paralyzed and learned to walk again. I don't know if you realize, but just those small gestures, it, it brightened up a very dark time in our life. To showing love and embracing a child who lost his limbs following a battle with the flu. That resonated to me as a father, but also made Chase's, made his world. And offering help to Joe, who was recovering from a heart and liver transplant. Our family and our entire community is eternally grateful for what you did. The push to inspire and the commitment to serve is why Brandon Graham is an NFL Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee. From book giveaways and clothing drives to her own resource center in the heart of Philadelphia, Kayla Brown is making it happen. Six years ago, she started Dimples for Days, a nonprofit dedicated to helping young people in Philly. And it's growing by the day. But Kayla says the work is just getting started. NBC 10's Miguel Martinez Valle has her story. From Dimples for Days, everybody say hi to Akela. Hi! Hey, guys. Hey, Kelly. Oh, my <laughs> gosh, you do have Dimples for Days. They're so cute. Akela Brown is known for her dimples, her smile, and her big dreams. But even in her wildest dreams, she didn't expect to be featured on a national TV show for the nonprofit she started. And then I started getting all of these followers. This no longer is this dream that I had when I was 13 years old, but I'm literally taking help in my dreamers and making them the leaders that I I am. And that's that's always going to be amazing to me. Akela started Dimples for Days back in 2016 after her dancing blew up on social media. When I started getting like the, the following, the people interested in me, my mom came to me and said, what are you going to do with this? I was already in a nonprofit field, and I said, you know what, Akela, let's think about starting a nonprofit. I didn't know what a nonprofit was, but my mom did. And since she was able to guide me, help me, that's when we started doing the book bag drives, feeding the homeless, and giving back to the community. By 2021, they opened their own resource center in West Philly, catering to young people she refers to as dreamers. As we were going to these different neighborhoods, it wasn't solid foundation places where they can come and have a safe haven. Any given day, Dimples for Days sees between 30 to 50 dreamers at their resource center. The goal is to give them a safe haven once they walk through these doors. They have volunteers and social workers at the center offering everything from help with homework and filling out job applications. It looks so good! To art projects and music classes, keeping young people engaged, active, and away from violence. 
when they're doing other things in a safe space, in a place that they can be learning, you know, they're kept out of the streets. They're not even in those predicaments. But the dream keeps growing. The biggest thing is additional resource centers um, and starting to dip our feet into group homes to provide adequate housing for youth in Philadelphia. Akela is currently attending Howard University. She's already taking steps to opening up a resource center in D.C. and to continue helping young people thrive here in Philly. Seeing my biological daughter grow and turn into a woman who's still providing resources and programming, and I know this is just the beginning of what she has in store, it blows my mind. Gives me a warm heart. <laughs> I know that my youth are looking at me. They're proud of me. So it's like, I can't stop. That's amazing. That's inspirational. Miguel Martinez Valle, NBC 10 News. Thank you for watching Discover Black Heritage. I'm Johnny Archer. A special thanks to our spoken word artist, Quentin Williams, and to everyone whose stories we told today. Remember, February is Black History Month, but we celebrate the achievements of African Americans every day.